Hello everyone and welcome to this video where I'm going to be showing you behind the scenes inside the game and inside the game engine. Because have you ever taken an online tutorial or a course and it teaches you how to create something like this? Basically it's like a prototype and then it tells you now just go and complete your game from this. And that's a little bit difficult. But I was thinking maybe I can at least give you a hint of what it looks like after a bunch of weeks, in my case nearly two months of work. So I'm just loading up my project here and it's in Unity 2023. We're right in the engine. I've reset the default layout here so we can see what's going on. On my left here I've got my hierarchy and we can see a little bit what's in the scene here and at the bottom we've got the project and console and on the right I've got my inspector and this looks a bit cluttered right here at the start and it's because I've loaded my menu scene here. One thing that you'll notice in many of my projects I only have one scene if you look in the scenes folder here, it's just called game and I've got a little test scene here as well. I actually personally don't like to use a bunch of scenes for different levels. I just instantiate levels as prefabs. And if I'm talking like mumbo jumbo now, it's probably because you haven't taken those very first courses that I was telling you about how to go from installing the game engine to understanding anything at all. So if I think say things like prefabs in Unity or scene view, or if I talk about cameras and packages, it's because you probably need to take a few of those courses first. This is more intended so you can see in the game engine, what does it look like? What's that magic stuff that ties everything together? And you'll find a few things. First of all, it's gonna be pretty messy. And I think that's one of the things I see. A lot of people are trying too hard to make something too perfect with pretty code, and they just get stuck at the very beginning. But the goal isn't to write pretty code, it's to make a fun game to play. In this uh, menu scene, if I rotate the camera here, you can see it's just I've just dropped a whole bunch of assets in here. And that's just to create a little bit of an interesting scene to look at when you press play. And if I press play here, we'll see the menu here and uh, on the hierarchy view on the left here, it's like a whole mess. And I've tried to tidy it up a little bit. I've got stuff under canvas. I've actually got a couple of canvases, but we also have this don't destroy on load here because uh, this is what's running in the game at all times. And it's in this one canvas, I've got a whole all my menu panels. So in the panel here, if I click on settings, you can see that it's actually enabling a different settings. And these are just in my hierarchy here. I've got uh, different panels. If I go here, I can look, if I double click on these. These are different panels that are enabled and disabled. So as I click on different menu options here, we can go to, uh, we'll go back here again and we can see we've got video panel here. So if I go uh, video, it's just enabling and disabling these different uh, graphical panels. There's a whole bunch of code that goes behind how to enable and re-enable it. And I've made my own little uh, helper system that actually helps me to transition between different states. This is generally how I treat my, my panels. You can also see that if you just enable and disable a game object, it wouldn't animate like this. So I've actually had to create some custom code with, uh, there's a really cool uh, software called Flowent. It's a free and it's a tweening library. That's really, really good. I'll put a link in the description to that one. When you enable something, you can tween it, which basically means either lerping it or using a, an, an easing algorithm to have the panel. So if I go back here again and I go to achievements, you can see that it slides in nicely from the side. Same thing with statistics. So I just, uh, not only do I enable and disable them in the hierarchy, I uh, animate them a little bit as well. So it looks a bit neater. And that comes to polishing the game. If you just add these little subtle things, it just feels like a more polished game. You can also notice that I changed the camera angle a little bit in the menu here. And these are just Cinemachine camera, virtual cameras that I enable and disable. So this one overrides it. Uh, it's a new perspective here, this menu two camera. And uh, when that, that one is enabled, uh, which is uh, if I click on statistics, it enables that virtual camera and Cinemachine just takes priority. This has a higher priority of 200, so it just takes this camera. And then when I disable that one, Cinemachine just goes, okay, there's no camera. I'll have to default back to this one with a priority of 100. You'll see that it says don't destroy and load here. So these are persistent things that uh, are running in the game all the time. And uh, so I've got audio stuff, event things, uh, high score management, uh, a level handler here as well, a state manager, because one thing in, uh, you can see that I'm in a menu state. Usually what you create something after a course is just the main core game loop, so inside the game itself. But normally you'd have to take it from that loop and just expand it into like a menu state, a play state, a pause state. So if we play, press play here, let's just do that. You see that it jumped to my in it, play in it state and then into the play state. And now I'm in my play state, so I'm playing the game. I've spawned uh, the players and the enemies and I'm now reading the input, but I'm still effectively in the same scene. If I pause here now, actually I'll press escape, then you can see that it actually transitioned here into a pause state. There's many ways you can do the state management, but I've opted into a way where I have a hierarchy of game objects 
where I have my own state logic scripts. When these are enabled, you, you can have an update loop within this one, within the pause state that checks for, for example, am I clicking on continue? Have I hit escape? Should I do something? Have I pressed restart? So you want to be able to check stuff during the update loop here in pause, but you also want to have stuff that you can execute when you transition in and out of states. So when a state starts, you want to be able to trigger some logic. Maybe you spawn the level or something and the player in it, for example, I have things where I start the music. I can uh, set the game object here as uh, active, which is uh, menu decorations. I'm actually switching those off. Tasks on begin state is nothing that exists in Unity. Instead of having to code this every time, I've created code logic that uh, makes me able to start and stop things when, when I enter and exit states. You'll see that this looks like it's a Unity plugin or something, and it's because I've made a custom editor for this. I've coded so I can show UI panels on begin state. It comes into play in it, and then I want to show UI panel, get ready panel, because it says get ready to play. Similarly, on uh, when you go from play in it to play, I've got uh, a game panel I'm showing, which is, um, if I click on this one, I can see this is the one in the background you can see. So it's actually showing just uh, this game panel background. Anyway, let's uh, go back into the game. So. I've been talking a little bit about the different, these are the menu panels, and down here we have the different states that I'm transitioning, and it's important that you create stuff for your game where you, you can transition from the game. So from menu to play, uh, to pause, resume, restart, and game over, and if you've completed the level, maybe you want to have something as well where it says congratulations, you've completed the game. If we continue the game here, you can see that it's still running, everything's uh, coming up and, and stuff in the background, and maybe we can just have a little bit of, like, look what it looks like inside the game itself. So again, I'll pause here. Here we go. And now I'm in the scene view, and you can see, I still, let's see, we can, if I double click on, uh, if I find my character here somewhere, so it's a bit cluttered. We've got some arrows stuff here, if I minimize this a little bit, we've got uh, the player itself, so if I double click on the player, now I'm actually in the scene view, and the player sees this, neat and nice and tidy. The game engine behind the scenes, it looks like this, which is an, probably an absolute mess, and you're wondering, how can this make sense? So let's have a look at a few things and see what makes uh, sense. First of all, I can enable and disable these gizmos. The gizmos are a way to just be able to see things. Here it's like showing me where sounds are playing, and uh, it's played sounds because I'm when something happens, like a stone crumbles or something, or a, an arrow hits, or I'm shooting, there's a sound effect, and it just shows where the last sound effect, because I'm pooling the sound, my, my sound effect objects. So it's actually moving a pooled sound effect object to here, playing the sound, and then just letting it fade out. And I do that sometimes with pooled sound effects, just to be able to play them everywhere in the scene without having loads of uh, audio sources everywhere. You can actually see these gizmos in play mode here as well. You can enable those uh, if you want to be able to see them when you play the game. But I usually keep them off and then we just look at the scene here. And we can see here that uh, let's observe a few things. In this game, the level crumbles behind you. So it forces you to move forward from left to right. It's because the level crumbles behind you. And I've actually left these blocks here, which is just a separate layer of blocks behind here, if I look from behind. And that's just so it didn't go completely empty, because now you can see roughly what the level looked like before it crumbled. So it's just a visual thing to keep you a little bit more oriented. And then you can see these are all decorative things. So the trees here in the foreground and in the background. And I've achieved like this hazy effect, because I think it's really nice to separate the background from the foreground. So by fading the background into like a light blue color like this, it's more easy for the player to focus on the gameplay here, where the background is just like a distant hazed pretty thing. The way I've achieved that is a combination between, if I go into here, let's go uh, rendering and lighting. So I think I've got some environment here. I've got um, a fog enabled which looks like that. So that is part of the trick, but it's a bit of a smoke and mirrors or whatever you call it, because I've also created these panels. You can see they're a bit difficult to see because the way the shaders are, but these are panels with the transparent additive uh, material to make it even bluer and even nicer because I couldn't achieve that look with just a fog, it turned out. So I just uh, thought, okay, I'm just going to view the game from the side. So I might as well slap these panels. Uh, it can be a little bit hard to see because of the sorting order on transparent things. And everything else is, uh, we've got uh, here, we can click on uh, my enemies, we can click where am I as a player, I'm over here. So this is my game object with my weapon, and uh, I've instantiated this from a prefab. So I've got my my mesh object here, here's my armature for the bones, you don't really see those. We've got uh, my rifle is in my hand, it's a game object as well. And uh, we've got uh, 
here are like some objects that are spawning the trails when you double jump and dash. So that's a, a trail renderer that's here. And then I've got on damage uh, camera shake. This is a, a, a thing that can actually, when I get hurt, I send an impulse to a cinema machine, so the camera shakes. And if I press play again, we can actually, let's put the scene view down here and move this one up. If I play up here in this little tiny window, we can see what's going on. Because you'll notice as well that I'm not spawning the whole level. It's stuff going on in front of us, but the whole level is not here because it's meant to be going on forever. And that's a performance thing that I've had to do. You cannot spawn the whole level and just expect everything to work smoothly. The frame rate will not work. <laughs> well, it'll work, but it's going to be super slow. It's like a slideshow. You can hold the right mouse button, actually, and use uh, WASD to pan around in the viewport. I didn't actually know that. Uh, and it's uh, similar to how Unreal Engine works. But now I'm going to put myself here in the in, in the scene view, and then I'm going to press play and play in this little tiny window up here. Because now you can see if I can actually see what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm shooting, I'm coming, and there you can see that it builds a little bit extra of the level. Uh, okay, now I died, so that's a bit of a pain. But you could see that it, it created this part of the level. It's because I've pre-built everything, so it's there, but then I've disabled segments of the level. And as the player comes closer to those, I'm detecting I'm close now, so I'm going to activate this level. I don't want to instantiate the prefab because that's super heavy. If I were to instantiate this whole section that just popped up here as a prefab, Memory allocations would go in, it'd fill up stuff for garbage collection, it'd pause the game. <laughs> you don't really want to do that. Let's play again and see if I can actually get... So here we see, I'm just going to play at the top here. And maybe I can actually pause this one and bring this one down a little bit. Make it a little bit bigger. There we go. And then pause. Here we go. So I'm playing the game here and hopefully I'm not going to die this time. Um, we'll go here, we'll shoot, in, and you can see soon we should be in view. Okay, I might have to just... Ah. Okay, I'm nearly dead already. It's too difficult when it's so small, apparently. Okay, I need a help, help kit. And here we go. Now we can see that I'm here, and let's pause the game. There we go. So now it's built a little bit more of the level. And uh, we can also see in the back here that it's uh, taking the level away as well. Because uh, I want to have a little bit in the background, because if I take it away too soon, my background objects like the trees here and stuff will start uh, popping away. Other optimizations that I've had to do to make it run as fast as, uh, as it is, if, if I just shoot a few enemies and stand still here, let's see, make sure that there are no arrows here that can hit me. Uh, let's just dig myself a little hole here. There we go. And you can see here now that these are just not breaking, they're just uh, snapping away. And that's a performance issue because I cannot see those anyway, so I don't really want to crumble those blocks. But as I get closer to where my character is here, now they start to break us apart soon. Here we go, now we're starting to get that effect where they shatter the blocks. It's because now they're in view, or I c they'll be able to come into view. Now I'm like watching something ultra wide here, normally you'd see something like this. So it's an important that I start to crumble the blocks before I get into view here. Otherwise, I just might as well just take them away because you're not going to see those uh, fragments of the stones anyway. So I just detect how far am I from the player? Am I in view? And if I'm not, I'll just take away the objects. I deactivate them. I don't actually destroy them either. I deactivate them so I don't see them anymore. As I get closer and it's going to be in view, then I can start spawning these fragments instead. So the gameplay, it's just... A, and there's tons of more optimizations that you can do to this. You'll have to find a balance because you could spend, you could over-optimize things as well and go into like minute detail. But a few things on this on the thing here is that I'm actually pooling the broken objects and I'm pooling those uh, these fragmented rocks. Uh, so they're all pooled objects because if I didn't pool these, these are every single little uh, fragment of uh, stone block here is uh, a rigid body with physics. So if I didn't uh, pull them and reuse them, it would be super expensive. And I think what we'll do is to show you a little bit more on that, because that's a bit of a... That takes maybe a few days extra of work, but if we... We can see that the crumbling is starting here. We'll come a little bit closer. Here we go. Let's go pause it. Move over here. We can see... Another thing is that I let them fall for quite a bit, but down here you can see there's nothing below this point. And it's because I make sure to destroy anything that also gets out of view down here so if it passes a certain y value then um, or a negative y value it goes if it goes below that i'll just d delete them if i press on pause here you can see that they're all just disappearing because there's no point showing them i'm probably showing them a little bit too long i could have optimized it maybe and start destroying them here instead so we can see 
here are all the sound effects that were played. We can see the crumbling level. It's here. We've paused it. Now it might be good to see. So what about those blocks? Because uh, that was one of the things. It's a bit of a key feature of the game and it's a bit making it a little bit different. So what I've done is uh, under uh, pool manager here, we can see damaged pool and block pool. And you can see I have a whole bunch of objects here. Some of them are deactivated and some of them are activated. If I, if I double click on these, I can get a shortcut. We can see that this object here has got a lot of children object. And these are all the fragments of the stones here. And they have a collider on them, a sphere collider, and they have a rigid body. The reason why I'm using a sphere collider is because here's another very important optimization thing, a trick. A sphere collider is the fastest collider that there is in any game engine. You might think, oh, sphere is difficult, it's loads of faces, but it's super simple to detect if a sphere is colliding with another sphere. All you have to do is check the distance between two points, and that's your perfect sphere collision. So initially, I actually had different, I had box colliders on these, and they're pretty fast as well, not as fast as sphere colliders. But the problem with the box colliders is that it was unnecessarily getting the blocks stuck. And as I pushed through blocks as a player, if, if I do this, for example, if I, if I started to shoot, they got a little bit stuck and it didn't actually feel that good so it turned out that it felt more like a butter knife going through a hot butter knife going through butter when i changed it so it felt a lot better with sphere colliders even if they just maybe it's too smooth for some games but for this game it worked really good and on the left here we can see that all of these like the fragments but all the, the particular parent objects here they get enabled and disabled and what i have to do is uh, once one is used and it falls down, I disable it and put it back into this pool of objects because then I can just move it to a new place and, and reactivate it. If I select this block here, for example, we don't really know that one's uh, down here now, but if I press play, we'll probably see that uh, that block is going to get act activated at some point in my pool. There we go, it's probably been nearly activated. It's difficult to see. Uh, but yep, there we go, now it's activated and let's double click on this one and I'm actually right by this object now. So the important thing is when you pool objects and you have to reactivate them, there's quite a lot of logic when you pool the objects. So they, they, because you have to reset the state of them, I have to reposition all the, the rigid bodies and the colliders and the composition of a damaged or a broken block. I have to reassemble that while the game object is disabled, move it into place and reactivate it so it crumbles again. Because I had a lot of bugs in the beginning where I couldn't quite reset that properly. So sometimes I'd come to a block, shoot it and it just, like the fragments were all over the place already, which sucked. And it took a lot of troubleshooting to figure out sometimes uh, you ha you're restricted to what you can and cannot do with uh, when you move rigid bodies. So that took a bit of time, but it's worth the effort because the performance would not would have tanked if I did do this method, especially for all these destructive blocks. So what else is going on? Uh, that's the pooled objects. Uh, they, they could be like a big course just on pool management, but it's an important concept. I use that for bullets as well, as well as the fragments. Ideally in some games, like in uh, Line War, for example, we could have done with, with object pooling all the units so we don't have to respawn them. But every time you pull something, it's also more work involved. So you have to find that balance between what's worth pulling and what's not worth pulling. Maybe we can have a little bit look at uh, the enemies. And uh, if I'm actually going to, I'm just going to die here. It sounds awful, but let's, uh, or let's just restart this one. And let's come to a simple enemy. So we're going to kill him because he doesn't, but we can look here. You see that, uh, like we've got a few characters that are jumping around here. And uh, that doesn't come for free either. <laughs> but we can go to, in the scene view, we can look at this character here. And here's an enemy, knight. And this is a, a clone here, which is a instantiated prefab. And a whole bunch of stuff goes on onto my game objects here. You can see that normally, like on a plain game object, you just have uh, like a transform and uh, nothing else. And then you start filling up. I've got a rigid body because it's applying physics to it. And then I ho have a whole bunch, and I like this concept of writing really small scripts now and attaching them with clear logic, and I name them very distinctively. So we can even see by the names of my components here, the, I've got a character movement script, I've got a character sensor script, which is basically a whole bunch of sensors where you can uh, detect what's in front and behind a character. I've got AI components here, which is a knowledge base for the AI, so it knows things. It can AI answers. Um, that's a component that I wrote, which will be able to say, I'm on at a traversable edge, I'm at a wall, I'm at an enemy. So I've created all these uh, different conditions based on the knowledge, based on these sensors that I've got. I'm building up a knowledge base and I create events that are triggered. I'm at an edge now. Um, am I at, uh, can I jump to an elevated platform now? 
and I've named these events really clearly. Can I land if I jump forward? Is the uh, ground below me beyond my jump capacity? This is nothing that comes with Unity by default. I've created all of these in the AI answer script. And, but if we load it up, we can have a peek in here and you can see I've created all of these uh, Unity events, which I try to name like at enemy, at wall, at small elevation, step up, within player proximity buffer. So, and I can, I, I raise these through code. What else have we got on this one? We've got a melee combat script. We've got a ragdoll spawner, because when they die, I replace the knight here with a ragdoll. So this is a little script that's responsible for that. We've got an animator, which animates based on like the movement. And if the knight is jumping or doing a melee, a melee attack, then I've got a, an animator script here. So we can also look at, uh, maybe if I double click on, we'll go to window and go into animation and show the animator. Here we go. I've, since I've got that character highlighted now, we can probably bring that one up here. We can see that it's currently in a jump fall state. And I've got an upper body layer which uh, contains uh, different attacks and shield impact um, animations. But on the base level, it's pretty standard. It's I can do idle run, which is a blend tree here between idle and run animation. And at the base, I've got uh, jump fall, which it basically transitions into this. If I'm not grounded, it just transitions into this jump fall pose. And then uh, if I press play here, we can see probably that oh, it just got hit by it. <laughs> massive blade there and then it fell to its it fell down here did it yeah he's still alive and if we look at the animator okay he died sorry that's a shame <laughs> all right so let's restart this one again and have a look at another one because we need to pick another enemy to follow to. so here we go we've got a few few guys jumping again so let's have a look at this guy i cannot click in this view but i'll have to just find where we are and we've got uh you you can jump. So I've got a few gizmos and stuff that I can enable to draw. And I think I can actually enable uh, so you can see a bit of drawing on this one. If I go to enemy and click on the root object and then look at spawner. Let's see. AI knowledge. Here we go. I created a little debug thing for the, for the knowledge. Because in order to detect whether the player can jump or not, it, it's actually a pretty tricky thing to solve, I'd say. Like, it's one thing just having a character standing still and then shooting at you. But if I wanted the enemies to be able to walk a little bit and jump a little bit and create a little bit of a challenge, I've created this thing where I can do, like, draw the debug uh, lines for this. And if I press play now, you can see all these weird lines. What are all these about? And I'm actually shooting ray casts to detect whether the character can land. You see, let's press play. And here it's a little bit better. You can see that. First of all, it scans forward in front of the character here, which is indicating this line here. And then you can see that it shoots raycast, it's called. It's actually, you shoot an invisible ray and you see if I'm hitting anything. And the reason why I've colored these red here is because when it shoots the ray down, it detects that I cannot land anywhere. So it's telling me that it's too far for me down to be able to jump back up to where I came from. So I've just basically shot a ray and said, I'm not hitting anything, so I'm going to label this distant to say that I'm not hitting anything. So um, if I fall down here, I'm not going to be able to clear it. And then you can see here that I've got a green one. And that means that if I can jump this far forward, there is ground beneath me and I can land over there. So that's pretty good. And then it can detect how far away is this. And I've got like a little bit more gra granular close to me here because I've got like right under me, I've got right in front of me and right behind me. And then at regular one meter intervals, I shoot like so one meter forward, I cannot land. Two meters forward, I cannot land. Three meters forward, I cannot land. But then it detects, okay, over here I can land. And it also knows its trajectory, so it knows how far can I jump. So if I jump, I'll be able to land over here. And since I had like this AI answers thing here, that would be one of these things where like, uh, can land if jumping forward. That's going to be true now because it can detect that I can jump further than this distance. My ray cost that I'm shooting tells me I can land over here. So I'm going to be answering yes to this one. And then you have the AI logic script that says, should I jump? Maybe I have a preference to jump, or maybe I should just turn around at the platform instead if I get there. So, and I'm also doing uh, shoots up, and this one doesn't have anything over its head. So it's got clear ways to jump it. And these boxes here, I've actually, I had to custom hack a little bit. Sometimes you'd come to an edge over here where you go like, you shoot a ray up and you hit here, and you say, I cannot uh, <laughs> jump up because there's something above my head. But theoretically, 
like you should be able to maybe jump up because uh so you can get into these little tricky situations i ran into a whole bunch of them so in the end i just had to find some shortcuts so i created these little boxes as well to say like if it's clear right here i'll be able to jump up to elevated gap so it answers a few of those questions and this is uh just going on for all the characters all the time and I don't run this every frame on every character because that would be too intensive. And I'm only rendering it for this one character now. Let's see, which script was this? It was, uh, I'll click on the character again. There we go. And the script name, here's maybe a little hint that you didn't know about what we can do. If I go into the night, it's called AI knowledge. So if I type AI knowledge now, it shows me that script on all my objects. Now I can multi-select these and click in and now it should show me the logic for all of these characters which might go super slow we'll find out so this is what the game does behind <laughs> the scenes all the time and it still runs pretty performantly which is actually surprising to me because there's so many calculations and you can imagine now if i if i would have spawned the whole level then if i would have spawned it 3000 blocks into the future here you can only imagine the performance <laughs> hit that that would take and this is probably even pushing it because I should probably, I think I even deactivate the, the logic for some of the characters over here. You see that these don't have any triggers yet. And it's because the activity, they're acti first they get spawned or activated. And then when I'm close enough, I activate their ability to, to read the world and see what's going on. Again, it's a performance issue, so I don't have to do it. And I spread it out as well over a bunch of frames. So like this character might do it, but on a different uh, interval compared to this character and this character. So they run at different rates and I try to spread it out so it's um, not all over the place. These yellow diagonal lines as well, that indicates, because this one is shooting rays as well to see, can I see the, the enemy at all? Or in, in this case, I'm actually the enemy. And you can see that these are all yellow, so no one, none of them can really see me. But if I go up here, let's see if I can. Whoa, okay, there we go. And then pause again and then i think i actually just jumped away so let's double click on here we can see are there any green lines here now there's no one can really see me still which is pretty interesting so i'll just jump up here all right and apparently i'm not changing the colors of those but there's a whole bunch of lines that they're checking if uh, if they can see me and Again, these are ray casts that are shot, and you can see that these are a lot of ray casts. So if you're not careful, I mean, this is pushing it probably on a mobile platform. You'd want to optimize this a lot more, but I get away with it on a computer pretty good, and a console would work as well, I think. So it looks absolutely crazy, and I can actually activate these in, in this view as well, in the game view. So if I look here, let's do... Oh, now if I press play again, they're all going to disappear, actually, because I only activated them for... Uh, uh, for characters that were visible in the scene. They're not activated by default, so now they, they wouldn't be visible. Anymore. It's just these spawn points. The red dots and the green dots are just my spawn points where they are. Uh, maybe we should have a look at a few of the hazards as well as a uh, one more peak. So let's go up to one that actually swings a little bit more. So let's jump up here. Maybe I should switch off the gizmos again. Uh, there we go. And we'll go here, and here we go. I want to see if I can find a section where we've got multiple uh, obstacles. So here, like this swinging one might be good if I don't die here. Well, let's just kill him as well. There we go. So if I go into the scene view here now, let's bring this one up. Oh, I'm going to get killed. Oh, unless he kills himself. So we can look here and click on the spinning blade. So here is, um, let's pause that one and bring it up. This is um, a collider and it's a game object like any other. It's called Blade and it's got a hinge joint on it and it's got uh, a blade cutting script that I created and a damage dealer script that I created so I can detect whether it's hitting my character and if it is, I'll be able to deal some damage on it and I can say what type of ID you have I got because I collect the information, I log all the statistics about the damage. So we've got a blade spinning here and it spawns particles uh, back and it swings back and forth. If I click on the, this little arm here, we can see that it's got a hinge joint as well. And this one's got a motor on it, uh, which toggles just back and forth. So if I increase the speed, the target velocity to 600, it'll like swing that a little bit faster. So, okay, now I need to get out of here. Um, Maybe I'll, uh, I'll like just activate the sheet code actually, so I can skip forward a little bit further. If I 
Oh, here we go. Now I've skipped forward like, super far into the game. This is actually still activated in my game build, so I have to be careful not to leave that. Here we've got a ballista that's been shooting some stuff as well. We've got these hammers. And if I pause, or actually here I should be safe, I think. Uh, so I can go here again. Now I'm super far ahead. You can see that I'm all the way over here. So, because I, I've skipped forward in the game, so I just bypassed this whole section and just jumped myself all the way over here. And here's what I wanted to, I think I should be pretty safe here, so we can look in... Uh, uh, the way I do it as well, there's multiple ways to do it and probably better ways to do it, but I've got all of these level, level segments that I said. I spawn these initially before the game starts, before my game round starts. I want to create everything into the scene so it's all done and dusted with my memory allocation. Everything's in my memory. I don't have to reload anything, which is uh, could create a visible like stutter in your game. I think that's a common mistake that people instantiate too much during the gameplay. And then I just activate the, the few segments that are in visible reach here. And these segments include uh, things like my knights, but it also have the blocks here. So if I look here, I can see all the blocks are in here. These could probably be pooled as well for better performance. Uh, but I found through testing that it wasn't worth at this point to do it, so I just pri prioritized to get my levels built and out there. We also have the spawn positions, which are basically these dots where I can spawn different characters. Here we see stuff that are in within reasonable range for me is uh, happening. We've got the ballista over here, reloading and shooting. Oh, it's actually shooting from all the way over here. Um, it's pretty dangerous. <laughs> and then we've got the catapult here. This is using... Uh, the, a hinge joint as well. We can look at this catapult arm. We've got uh, a hinge joint here with uh, a spring load of 6,000 and then I can alternate that through a script that I've got um, so it actually increases this, well it flips the polarity of the string or the target uh, position and brings it back down after it shoots. But then I have to increase the spring force because th this stone here is pretty heavy so it, it was a bit of a balance game to get that sorted. Yeah, so we've got the catapults here. These swinging mazes they're animated using uh, a tween curve, I believe. So this is the flow end library that I was telling you about that I'm actually really happy about. Let's see if we've got a uh, maze. Here we go, a maze script. So in this script, I have it. We can't really see it on there, but it's basically tweening like a, a rotation with the damping forward and back. So it looks uh, and then it's creating a cinemachine impulse when it hits. So uh, if I'm close to it, this cinepulse machine uh, hit makes the camera shake a little bit. Uh, we've also got these hammers over here somewhere. Where am I even? Um, over here somewhere. So here are the hammers. Here's another interesting concept I think uh, that I put on the hammers. Maybe we'll just do zoom in here. And if I go here and expand the hammer block, if I can, uh, we can see that the damage I apply here is pretty interesting. And you can see that it's only enabled for a split second, this game object, and it's a collider inside here. And this is actually what damages the player. And you can see that it's only, if I pause it, maybe when it, right there, there, you can see it, it enables it. And it's inside the object and it's just enabled for a short fragment of time. The reason why it's only enabled for a little short while, it's because uh, when I jump onto the hammer, I don't want to die. And also, it's if I'm standing super close to the edge here, it, they were treacherous in the beginning. These killed you left and right, even the slightest touch, and you'd die from them. And it was ridiculous. It was too difficult. So I've timed the enablement of this damage dealer, and I've also just put it inside here. And you can see that I've got other here. Like, if I click on the hammer itself, you can see that it's got a whole bunch of other colliders. And it's because I'm preventing enemies from going too close, so they, they could basically hit through the hammer. And then I've got the buffer zone as well, where you basically you can walk up to a hammer and stand against it without getting hurt. Because it was just too easy to die before. So that, that those are a few tricks that I've implemented for the hammer logic. And they just swing back and forth and do the damage. I don't really do physics damage. I, I just do like an overlap damage to check um, if I'm... This is a trigger, so it's not like physics collisions. It's doing a... Uh, is, um, is the trigger actually touching the player rather than any physics hits. For the camera movement, I'm using Cinemachine. Maybe if I go here and then just jump, you can see that it's dampening the camera pretty nicely. So I'm using the Cinemachine package. I, for years, I reinvented the wheel all the time to create like my own camera scripts. But I highly recommend just using something like Cinemachine in this case. So if I try to survive this one there and then jump up here, and here you can see, okay, I'm gonna kill that one. 
So here's where I want to be able to stand here by the hammer without getting killed. So that's why I had those buffer zones. And I can actually switch the shader view. Let's do that. So this, I like the trees a lot. They're really decorative. I found a super cool tutorial about how to create fluffy trees. So I followed that one. And uh, there's bas basically a whole bunch of billboards. And if I change my view here. Okay, here we go. And now I'm going to switch to, this is what it looks like without lighting. So if I toggle those, you can see the lighting does a lot. The shadows, lights and shadows makes a lot of the difference here. Uh, but if I switch to this one, you can see here's uh, all the meshes as well. And it's, um, I'm using no texture mapping at all here at all, except the tree leaves, which are basically using a stencil, just a stencil. Everything else is just colored with my Infancia Pixpile palette. So I'm coloring each face a different color, like different grays here. And then I've got uh, shiny surfaces. That's all part of the Infancia Pixpal palette texture. I've saved so much time on uh, UV unwrapping and uh, doing the uh, texture painting. It's ridiculous how much time is saved. And I'm happy with the result, the way it looks like this. I'm, I'm really happy. It looks neat and clean. And there's only one texture for nearly the whole thing. Everything is using just a 100, 128 by 120 pixel palette texture. So I can just assign colors quickly to different faces. But if I go here, you'll see this is absolutely insane. The amount of triangles that it's rendering here. Because I realized that the, <laughs> the trees are pretty intense. See, they just go black here because there are so many polygons. Can you believe it? There's I'm a bit surprised that it can actually handle it this well. So it's very important that the, the graphics card uh, or game engine calls everything that's not really in view. Because if I had to render all of this all the time, it's pretty crazy. Imagine all the trees. I have like hundreds of trees or even thousands. So I could probably optimize this a lot by reducing the number of billboards on the trees. I didn't actually realize it was this many. Because you don't really think about it when they all obscure each other. All right, folks, so there we go. There was a, a bit of an in-depth uh, look behind the scenes. Uh, there's so many things I could talk about and I'd want to show. And the fun thing is I've recorded every minute of creating this entire game from the very first line of code and the very first primitive prototype all the way to the, getting the game to this level and even beyond because I've recorded also creating a Steam page for it, creating the artwork for it and promoting the game on Steam implementing things like Steve achievements, uh, doing uh, the keyboard controller, remapping things, everything, composing the music. I've recorded every single step, so I'm really excited uh, about this whole project. The game itself will be releasing on Steam. It's called Unfair Rampage Nightfall, and it's going to be coming out uh, later on this year. And uh, if you do me a favor and wishlist that, that would be kind of cool if, you, if you're interested to play this game once it comes out. It's actually a fully playable experience. It's taken it from that little main core loop to a really challenging game that you can play over and over again. So replayability value was one of the core things. That's why it's procedurally building the levels. And you can uh, it's easy to learn your, your, uh, your ways of navigating and shooting, but it's going to be hard to master and pushing that limit to, to get your high score up should be pretty challenging. So I'm hoping a lot of people will find uh, that to be fun about the game. And uh, I'll be also creating the in the development course, which is going to be super exciting because uh, you'll be able to follow this along and uh, I mean, it's seven weeks worth of recording, so uh, theoretically everything is viewable. I'm going to try to take everything, every, all the important steps, compress those down and package it into to really important uh, like design steps and how, how the certain things were made. And I'll be able to fill my YouTube channel here with loads of videos like this. If you have any specific questions about certain thing about the game, feel free to put it in the comment and I'll hopefully I'll be able to make a video about it and show it. I'd, I'd love to share a little bit of how everything was made. So feel free to comment and ask those type of questions and I'll try to do my best to answer those. I also want to thank the sponsor of this video. It's uh, Sentry, which is an application monitoring software. I created a video about it earlier in the year and uh, I'm going to be implementing the application software monitoring on this game now. It's very important to have that in place when I release the game on Steam because so many things will happen behind the scenes that I have no clue about. And usually you'd find out through them by getting an angry email or a feedback form or a review comment saying that I've, I'm, it keeps crashing or it's bugging out. So by installing and using uh, my application monitoring software, I can actually, behind the scenes, if something happens, if an exception is raised or there's a bug of some sort or the game crashes, the Sentry plugin that is available for Unity it's integrated into the Unity game and it actually captures those moments and sends those to a really cool dashboard and to a, a behind the scenes panel. I get an email notification about it. I can go in and drill through everything like exception logs. I can see detailed information about uh, when it's happening, what type of a system it is, what GPU it is, what operating system it is, how much memory it has. I get a stack trace. 
It's beautiful. <laughs> I really like that tool. So I'm implementing that as part of this game journey as well, because it's super important to support your game once it's released and out there. So thanks to Sentry, you guys rock and you really nailed it with, uh, with your application monitoring software. All right, so thanks a lot for watching this video. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks to all my patrons as well on uh, patreon.com slash And I'll see you in a video shortly again. So until next time, have a great one and I'll see you then. Bye for now.